gender, their inclusion, and in times to come, how the industry is going to evolve. So today we have, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, a lot of you have already seen and you already would have gone through his profile. Today we have Anjan Pomek. Uh, thank you, Anjan, for joining us. Uh, <laughs> we really appreciate you taking out time and talking to us today about a very important topic as the uh, future of learning in times to come. Thank you for having me, Pallavi. No, thank, thank you. And uh, I, I think uh, that in, especially this topic is all the more relevant uh, considering how times are changing, not just right now, but we, there's so much that uh, uh, companies have to struggle with in terms of future planning. There's so much that they also don't know what they don't know. And uh, the plugins uh, and additional knowledge from individuals and professionals like you who are you know overseeing with your thorough experience in this particular field uh, this, this there's no other better way but to prepare themselves as how to build the future you know organizations uh, one year two years or you know many years down the line so for everyone's sake i'll just uh, i just want everyone to know that uh, uh, Anjan Bhamek is a doctor fellow in HRM and OD from the Academy of Human Resource Development and uh, also a diversity and, diversity and inclusion and strategic engagement at the ILR school, Cornell. Um, there's a lot of academic and uh, I, I think that's how you're converting all the practical insights into the teaching and uh, we will benefit a lot from it today, Anjan. <laughs> Uh, you're also quite busy with your uh, current engagement at, uh, with the Reinsurance Group of America uh, as Executive Director, Talent and OD for Asia and Australia markets. So the diversity could have not become more diverse here. You're talking about <laughs> India, which itself on its own is an extremely diverse country. And then you are handling the Australian market as well. So, uh, wow. How, how do you handle all this, Anjan? Uh, before I even dive into the main topic, <laughs> how is it working out? Well, I, you know, you know, thanks for having me and Pallavi. Uh, great, uh, thank you for the introduction. But I, th I think one of the things that that really compels me over the time is, is that I've I've been in the human resource line for a while, um, and and critical mass of about eighteen to twenty years, and 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 one thread that you see across what you just said is HR. And, and, and one of the things that I live, breathe, uh, once in a while, my family cribs a lot saying that, hey, you might take the dog out once in a while. But, 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 but I, what I live, breathe and sleep is around, you know, uh, you know, you know being, being in that profession and thinking through the big picture. Uh, and, and I think one of, the, one of the kicks that I get out of doing this job is to support my business leaders. Uh, there is no better kick or high that I get if I work with them and say, "Hey, you know what? It's creating value." Uh, and to me, that's what that's what that's what actually um, uh, keeps me awake at night. And I think, and then, and then there's a lot way to go because it's an age of continuous learning. Um, uh, I have this 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 uh, this um, maniacal focus on continually learning new things. When as, because as you know, in challenging times like this, if you stop doing what you do in terms of learning new things, you might face a situation that you might lose certain competitive advantage or the capabilities that has been resident for a while. So that's what, that's what keeps me growing and, and, and living uh, by the day. Uh, uh, just to kind of talk to you briefly on Yes, and I think we were able to capture a lot of it in our one-to-one -one interview also with you, which uh, right. um, yeah. quite an apt day. We published the interview also today. So for uh, everyone's sake, if they want to know in detail what all keeps you busy and how your thoughts are around uh, you know, the work that you have been doing, then they can always go and refer to that. But let me, uh, let's, let's jump straight into understanding Anjan. Um, with every... With, with the eye that you have been keeping, you know, through your academic learnings and continuous learning that you're seeing for what is going to be the next, uh, uh, next upcoming trends, you know, for workplaces in terms of their own continuous improvement. What are the shifts that you, um, you see happening when we talk about the learning and development space in workplaces? What will change? Right. Um... Pretty apt a question. So, so, so before I even kind of get into and thinking through what that that would mean for learning and development, 
uh, and, and as I talked before the interview with me, you know, these are challenging times. Uh, uh, and, 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 and what is even a little more concerning is that we don't know the, the end of the tunnel, right? We seriously don't know when it's gonna kind of taper down at a very global level. So, I mean, I've been, if, if you look at, you know, one of those work that Michael Ryan from the WHO, or if you look at Ashish Jha, who's the head of uh, the US uh, pandemic resource, and if, if you look at fundamental narratives of, of, of specialists around this area in, 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 in pandemic research, you'll figure out that they don't seem to have the answers as of yet. And, and they've, they've been harping on the fact that it's going to be forever, mm -hmm. right? So it, that's a statement that's going to define a lot of enterprises. Uh, because if this is going to stay forever, uh, as you rightly said, the new normal needs to kind of rethink about how is it that we're going to run everything that we do, right? right. So my... So my, so my introspection and reflection on all this is that, that one of the things that I feel learning would contribute now, and I see this happening in different functions, is the fact that this learning and development is actually getting broad-based across functions. Mm -hmm. It's no more a learning for HR, giving some supply to the business. So it's actually, you know, sales uh, in a continuous learning graph marketing in a continuous learning graph, HR in a continuous learning graph. So, so learning is becoming an enterprise learning parameter. It's not a parameter of HR or OD or et cetera, et cetera. Just, just for an example in sales, and, and I've been in, in, in some capacity working with a couple of sales organizations in India and abroad. Mm -hmm. You know, earlier we used to kind of go and assess a potential of a market through actually visiting those outlets. You know, there, you know in a route, there are 50 shops Therefore, the market potential are 50 shops in, a, in an outlet. With the new normal, I'm not sure whether the salesperson to assess the potential of a new market would actually will be able to go to that 50 outlet. So, so a lot of focus will be now on modeling, on, on, on you know, taking representative samples of outlets and broad basing it. Say, hey, this is what it is. How would it look like for a bigger route or a bigger market? So a lot of analytics Mm -hmm. on and i'm just an example to say that and and that's a complete mindset change are we geared for it i really don't know some organizations have been pretty progressive to do that but increasingly you will find focus on modeling predictive analytics in functions like sales supply chain you know of ai robotics it was there but the impetus is there so right. if you see seen every functions r d will now focus on proactive health mm -hmm. which is hygiene uh, which is wellness to kind of get into after effects of health companies. So, so you see health companies looking at proactive learning around hygiene and, and wellness mm -hmm. versus reactive methods around medicines and generics, et cetera. Just a few examples. The other important thing that I feel is will change is the speed of change. You know, I was, you know, anecdotally speaking, I was, I was following Satya Nadella when he launched that Microsoft build uh, mm -hmm. platform yesterday at I think 10 p.m. at night. And he was doing it online. Microsoft doing a town hall online is, is, is fairly unusual. Uh -huh. But he did pretty effectively online. And he was saying a very interesting thing. He said, you know what? Microsoft had an innovation pipeline for two years. And they had, because of what's happening now, they're cutting short that innovation pipeline timeline from two years to two months. And yeah. that's humongous, right? So yeah. if you're looking at... If you're looking at a Microsoft who has an innovation pipeline for two years, getting shot for two months, is imagine the resources you will mobilize. So, uh, so the change that I see is there's a lot of resource mobilization which will happen where collaborations is going to become the key. So whoever doesn't know how to collaborate will will fall out of place, right? So, so that's the second. And the, the last part I think is, you know, when I think about what's going to change, it's it's also going to be. Um, our mindset of accepting the fact that mm -hmm. we can do work without going to work, right? So I did. I, I was. I was going to. I was going to. A, I was reading a, a good Indian research journal which said, 65% of the people during COVID um, want to get back to work, and that posed me a question: is that they're not ready to work from home? It's, everybody can work from home, but it's the prolonged effect of working from home is what's different from working two, three days at home. So, so it, it, it actually triggers a thought that we really need to work on mindsets and need to be prepared that look, you might not be in a position to go to office 
right. 200 days out of 360 days and how will that change with respect to the new dimensions on learning is something that we need to think through because 65% of your people are actually saying, I don't, I don't want to stay at home. I just want to go to work. And that's concerning yes. because they're not ready for not working from office. So, so these are some of the reflections which I think would, 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 would kind of help us think through at a high level what are, could be some of the implications. Yeah, the last part is extremely important here, right? Um, uh, uh, because especially because for the for, for generations, I mean, we as a society have been conditioned to wake up in the morning and go to work, step out from the uh, personal zone and step into a professional zone. And uh, all our conditioning, conversations, interactions, what we should wear, how we should sit, how we should even sneeze, you know. I mean, we, we do a lot of sessions and we, we, we do notice that people come about, uh, especially when you're asking them to create this distinction between their regular habits, you know, and terminologies that they use right. uh, their personal life and how to leave that habit outside office. So, you know, you have to give them the smallest example that there's certain things that come so naturally to human beings, but we somehow manage to let go of them okay. the minute we put ourselves in the official setup. Okay. Because that's the conditioning that has been given. Now, this has been a top to top bottom approach ever since, right? And uh, also look at the different industry structures. Until two months ago, anybody who was sitting and working from home and did not have an office address was not really taken like a serious professional also. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to know where's your office. Everyone wanted to know where your team sits. Everyone wanted to know whether you have- The rest. size of the room. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? So. Uh, number of people sitting in your office and everything and the location where your office is right I have seen people taking subscriptions of WeWork and other right. places so that they can just put that you know fancy uh, address in their uh, 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 visiting cards or on websites how do we so before the see learning comes in so many aspects right your first point that you had mentioned when I asked the question learning is also of a very different kind Right, we, we can talk about the knowledge based learning and the skill based learning, and we will get into that in this uh, later part of this conversation. But first and foremost, the learning is the distinction that the brick and mortar office or whatever our understanding of the official environment was no longer exists, and we don't know if it ever will exist in the future, also. So, who has to unlearn this thing first are the leaders who have been promoting this mindset. Right. Now, even for this part, wherein now people have to get used to working from home, right? This responsibility also lies on the leaders only to handhold. Yes. Right. And are they going about it? How well they are going about it? Because new sets and structures have to be put in place. So we right. have our own experience in helping companies, but I want to hear from you that uh, is this the same challenge that you are also experiencing? You know, in the in in your teams. Of course, since you're handling, uh, you know, uh, remotely, I'm sure certain structures are all put in place. But how should other companies go about helping their team members unlearn the corporate structure that used to exist earlier and get into the new learning habit of working from home? A oh, fantastic question. And I, and I think, you know, I love the point that you made in terms of the learning is beyond the knowledge and the skill at this point of time. It's going a little high level. Yeah. Uh, it's at the mindset conscious level. So, so fantastic uh, insight. And, and thanks, Pallavi, for bringing that up. Because I think a lot of us um, uh, as leaders, when, I, when we see our leaders, I think one of the good observations, and we talk positives once in a while in this day and age, is that I think the leaders are beginning to be more flexible with the fact that, hey, that's the reality and you need to empathy. You need to have that empathy to be able to make that person operate from a span where the work-life balance mm -hmm. will blur fundamentally. And I think my experience is the leaders, at least in this part of the region has been very, and at least in my company, has been extremely mm -hmm. empathetic to the fact that, you know, to an extent, and I'll share an anecdote, and I was having a staff meeting with my global HR OD teams and the group. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the head of HR, who apparently does this monthly catch up, 
told me that, look, we understand what you're going through. There is a, in a sense of mental fatigue that you go through when you work. You don't know when to stop working and start your personal life. But you know, in calls like this, we're okay if your, your Alsatian comes and barks in front of you or your kid comes and starts crying while you are talking to us or a kid just fiddles with your leg behind below and you're saying, you know what, I'm in a meeting, son, you can put it or your coffee comes on the table. You know, that's just an example to say that the amount of, and we wouldn't be, in certain organizations, we would not possibly welcome that level of flexibility in a structured setup in organizations. Right. And to me, that's a great, great example to say that leaders needs to be a little more empathetic, needs to be a little more, you know, flexible to be able to allow that room mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot avoid your little kid or your dog or your wife or your mother coming and say, hey, you know what, the light's gone off and it's time to go to the veg market. No, you can't. You can, you can actually possibly have to allow. So organizations need to adapt to the fact that that work-life thing is blurring. Yes. And I see leaders being extremely responsible and empathetic in these times of need. So that's the first thing. The other thing which I think leaders need to do mm -hmm. is to be able to catch that 65% who really wants to go back to office to actually see what would help them or motivate them to kind of work in some places which mm -hmm. is away from office. And, and, does, and does not mean all the time, COVID does not necessarily mean work from home. It's not a direct correlation. Things might be better tomorrow. But then there could be situations where you need to work differently. You know, you're, you're reaching out with a client in a different matter, in a different platform. So, so the leaders need to kind of reach out to that 65% and say, hey, what are the things that needs to do? And the third thing which is actually getting done from an OD standpoint is the fact that, you know, uh, again, there's a reach out which says globally across industries, 10% of our jobs would be earmarked to say 100% work from home perpetually. Hmm. So how do we manage that 10% of the, and that 10% of a 3,000, 5,000 people workforce is right. significant, right? Yes. So, so, so these are some of the data points that need to figure out how is it that we will enable through benefit systems, to recognition plans, to, to, to the engagement initiatives, to technology. So you need to start building investments on technology. Yes. Uh, you've never built it so much, uh, right? So you've got to possibly disproportionately license Zoom for the next five years uh, uh, and get the latest technology so that work doesn't get impeded. So these are some of the things that I have in mind. Uh, no, absolutely. Mind. And I think, I think, and because we have heard it from so many people, right? Um, empathy has become a byproduct of work from home. It's an automatic learning. See, they say that you can't teach empathy. There's no way. There are certain things you cannot teach, no matter how much, because it's an emotion. It's a, it's a state of mind. And it only happens when you yourself have been put into that situation or when you have lived a certain thing. So one of the byproduct in terms of learning that we see, not just in leaders, or maybe I, I should actually correct myself, especially in companies, leaders, is empathy. Okay. Right? Because now, now there's a child for that same person running and disturbing many things, right? So earlier, the same thing was not happening with them. Right. And now it is happening because they've been put in that situation. So one of the most beautiful output in terms of learning that has happened is, uh, is empathy. And that has been our experience and whatever we have been speaking from, you know, uh, from the industry people. Uh, but if they have to now convert it into knowledge and skill based, you know, um, and we have to take these numbers into uh, uh, you know, consideration also. We also see a lot of numbers being spoken in newspapers, print media, online discussions that we have with people that we are planning to continue for the next couple of months and work from home. Or we will be shifting you know, a certain percentage of our employee base to work from home. Or some company which was planning to start their operations in different cities have now decided that, uh, oh, if you're already setting a structure for, uh, you know, remote working, we might as well roll it out to the next office also. Why instead in this okay. infrastructure? So everyone is coming up with their own uh, formulas and, uh, you know, ratios of how they will be planning their workplace environment in times to come. But keeping all these things in mind, the continuous journey for each and every person, resource in the organization will still require them to stay up to date on the latest trends that are relevant for them to perform their job better. 
right? So I'm going to divide this into two sections, right? One are the technical skills, right? Of course, there are, with respect to a person being able to do their job better, they need to continue gaining certain knowledge. And second aspect of it is combined with behavioral learning, right? As you grow, you need to, uh, you need to start behaving, conversing, thinking, all these uh, uh, soft skills that we say will also need to be incorporated. Now, keeping that this, you can never take away, no matter where a person is working from. These two development work will continue being part of a workplace. What are the things, key aspects that we can now say that uh, will be let go of, you know? Definitely, should we say that classroom learning will no longer happen because it's not inclusive anymore? Or will it remain, but uh, there will be a combination of things? What exactly, because before I go into what will the future of learning look like, you know, whether it will be completely online, online also, is, are we going to go into AR, VR? I don't know. Before we get into that, should we, can, can we assume that classroom sessions will completely be uh, out of the picture for some time and maybe then eventually forever? Look, uh, let me try and attempt to answer uh, the question that you ask in in, in, Did in I two ways. Is that too much, Anjan? No, you didn't. You didn't because I think your last question was to the point, and I think the background was very. It's very relevant because that's the question I get to uh, from my business leader saying, "Hey, are you not going to do this coming here in Hong Kong?" So, so that's a question that you mm -hmm. tend to ask. But, but, but let me try and attempt to answer that. Uh, so, one of the things that that I have heard from business leaders is that this whole aspect, again, we're talking mindsets. Unfortunately, everything deals with the mindset because that's, that's the high degree of learning now. Is that there seems to be a mindset, and I, at the sake of sounding provocative, but there seems to be a mindset that mm -hmm. physical learning is more productive than virtual learning. Mm -hmm. Right? I've heard it. Yes. You've heard it. <laughs> Everybody has heard it. Okay. Yes. One of my reflections is that I, need, I, I might want to test that hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. I want to see if, 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 if you ask me that question, will classroom learning be relevant? The relevance of it will only be defined by what is more effective. Right. And going forward, the, 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 the frequency in which you will have virtual interactions and collaborative communication and learning uh, would be proportionately higher in the next 12 months is my prediction. Hmm. until we don't know what's going on in the next couple of years, but, but let's talk 12 months now. Right. I for sure know that my next 12-year learning plan is 100% virtual. So hmm. I've been, I'm very clear, right? So, so this is just an example for you. Now, whether it will translate into physical or virtual will only arrive if to see what is more effective and feasible. And from the effective standpoint, I would love to know whether virtual learning, what we're experiencing right now, uh, is okay, not okay versus physical learning? Is it creating value? Is right. it giving that same feel touch, all of that? Frankly speaking, there are a lot of work around it. People will have anecdotal statements, but I would like to test that hypothesis. So hmm. one of the things leaders are saying is that, hey, let's talk positive about virtual learning. There's nothing wrong with virtual learning. So let's talk good about, you know, Microsoft Teams, let's talk good about, you know, breakout rooms in Zoom, let's talk about polls, et cetera, and see, you know, and build that narrative around, hey, this is a different way of working, let's give it a shot. So right. that's a mindset issue. We should be ready to give that a shot. The other thing is whether physical learning in the near future would be a challenge. Um, to me, I would probably, if you push me against the wall and ask me this question, I would say yes. In the next 12 to 18 months, a lot of your mandates hmm. in bigger organizations would typically be, and multinational where their geographies involved, would typically hover around distant collaboration and virtual learning. Right. right. The challenge is how do I create this experiential uh, atmosphere right. in the virtual system? And that's a challenge which I think you know, you know, organizations will start have have to put learning platforms to ensure. Uh, so I could take them for an outbound and do some OD intervention. I can't do this now. How do I create that? Maybe similar to that in a learning environment. We've not even thought that through yet. 
Yes. Uh, so, 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 so I think that's the question to ask. And and and, and to, to, to you know, in a, in a long story short, I think it's going to stay for a while. Hmm. Um, uh, the positive messaging on virtual learning will happen. I have not seen anything very adverse saying, you know what, because of this virtual setup, the entire training went to a toss, never happened yet. And I don't know whether it's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, apart from the fact that they're here in their Zoom bandwidth issues, but that's fine, that's handleable. Uh, so I think let's talk positive about virtual learning. And it's going to stay for a couple of months. Uh, and organizations, what I hear is they are building on budgets on technology. And why are they doing that? It's only they are envisaging that they are now, um, you know, spending a lot of time virtual learning. The other last point that I want to make is that because of this whole window getting opened up on virtual learning, hmm. people who are sponsors of these programs will start comparing between physical and virtual. Earlier, there were no windows. Right. So now you have a frame of reference to say, hey, you know what? The first one is virtual. I mean, we had very rare virtual learning, and now you have physical learning. Now we've got an option. And the discussions will be around, you know, how costly is the physical learning? How costly is the virtual learning? Is it value for money? Is, is, the, is the ROL or the return on learning value creation versus the... So those conversations will become a lot more predominant. No, that's true, actually. And I think the, uh, we have been experiencing the same thing because uh, for the longest time, all our interactions... By the way, I come from an OD experience also. It's been 16 years now. Um, oh. so I, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, experiential learning happens much faster and more effectively. Uh, you can do simulations, which is very difficult to do in a virtual environment, unless you're extremely, unless you create a AR, VR, you know, kind of setup, which is once again, a very costly affair and requires a different kind of R&D and team structure. But coming back to this, um, we are also seeing that this, there's this constant, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, comparison between uh, a shift from the offline sessions to online, wherein uh, leaders are asking us that uh, Pallavi, we have to do this, but uh, do suggest if it will be as effective as a classroom session, right? And uh, that remains the main concern, uh, which is, of course, there are different, different category of leaders out there who either want to, you know, just uh, get something done because it is required for engagement. Second is you do the engagement, but at the same time, the second E also follows, which means that it was effective also. And uh, that's, that, that's a combination that we see companies between, between. looking for. Right. And uh, it is a struggle because uh, I think even from the development perspective, um, the technical aspects can still be taught, uh, but the behavioral nuances, you know, the soft skills part requires a very different co uh, content to be created and very different kind of uh, environment to be created. We are talking yes. about behavior related things. Right? Yes. If it was just textbook, if it was just about absorbing knowledge and answering some questions and doing away with yes. it, that's a different thing. But the behavioral part will be the bigger, I would say, the challenge that companies now have to look forward to. Because even if everybody is working in a remote mode and we don't know for how long or if it becomes the future of work eventually, um, wherein nobody ever cares or asks that, uh, do you have a physical office or not? You know, it's just taken as naturally as it is. Um, this, will, this will evolve in its own pace. Yes, yes, it will, yeah. It will, right? And yeah. so keeping these things in mind, Anjan, what, what exactly are the infrastructural and cultural thing other than, of course, I already see that the HR themselves are the people who are assigned for these responsibilities. Let's why, why just talk about HR, right? Let's just say use the word decision makers because every company right. instead of decision. I'm glad, you point, I'm glad you pointed that out. No. Because learning environment is, is, is now actually transgressing functions. Uh, I see my marketing team figuring out how do I interact with clients and right. build that experience. So you're absolutely right. Bang on. Yeah. So each decision maker, no, because the minute we say HR, everybody, you know, we're also sending a subconscious message that it's the responsibility of HR. If anything is not working in your company with respect to learning and development, go and look for HR, but it's not in their hands alone. Right. So every, everyone will, every leader will have to start thinking like this. Uh, and thanks for agreeing also. <laughs> so, in terms of the decision makers, what exactly are the kind of infrastructural, cultural, and uh, behavioral changes that they should they should look for or they should now relook at? You know, because before you start teaching others, you have to learn it yourself, right? right. And, uh, it's 
and nobody is thinking about them if they are the decision makers who is thinking about them right so for them let's talk about them first because if they understand this that what what all they need to uh, you know uh, uh, how would i say they need to relook at whether they should look at their uh, infrastructure whether they should look at the culture now the culture is something which is very absent it's like air right you can't catch it and fix it and rework it and then say that okay you are releasing you back right but these changes will be required right so how should these decision makers look at it and identify this so that then they will be able to create interventions around these yes so in terms of decision making uh, you know the decision makers um, and i'll tell you the reality the decision makers are actually in a very very as we talk today are at an extremely exploratory mode so they don't have all the answers now so yes, they make the decision but they don't have the answers yes. and frankly speaking that's natural because at this point of time i'm not sure how many of us actually have those answers but decision make and it, you're absolutely right because it's those decision makers whilst they might not have the answer will have to take a decision right whether to do it this way or that way then you know the poor guy will be left in the lurch right so so i think one of the things that the decision makers should think through and as I, and i alluded in your previous question is to start building that pro positive resonance around learning in a different way that culture of learning in a different way or a different mode has to be transgressed bear in mind that we are a generation of people globally which has gen x gen z gen y and i don't know what's coming next and gen yeah. g i think the, the gigs actually which are all together we are the only generation which has these humongous heterogeneous generations clubbed together and yeah. we need to think to leaders representing generations across we have young leaders and old leaders so and those are decision makers so they need to start building that positive reinforcement around virtual learning or different modes of learning i'm not even restricting to virtual learning that's point one the yeah. other thing that decision makers need to do is to start hedging for probabilities so when you don't have the answers you start hedging so if i were a decision maker i would think okay fine i really don't know how that will work and create value in 2021 but i'm going to hedge 100 million dollars or 50 million dollars on infrastructure for building capability or enterprise learning right because that transgresses function it's not hr so i'm going to start hedging some of it with a clear brief saying that hey i'm hedging it because i don't have all the answers now i will go on and learn as we talk the third thing that i would like to do emotionally and you talked about culture here is that and i i might be sounding stereotypical but i think you know the concept of unlearning is no is as important that is was never oh, absolutely. you know you days back the decision makers have to stop the narrative saying that oh you're not doing this stuff physically will it be effective you know what you said that the somebody came and said you know i want it as effective as it was in a physical setting so that they come with a premise Yes. uh you know the, the the conscious persona is that they are like uh assume that physically is affected than virtual That's they have true. to shred that mindset because if you start building that in you you might get into judgments which might be counterproductive for the function as a whole so that's another thing decision makers should do the last thing that i think is important is is the whole thing which i talked about in in the interview that you that you did learn, is the concept of adaptive caution we need to bring in leaders and decision makers who are in a position to have high levels of adaptive caution had had worked in different business cycles of firms not worked in a manufacturing for 20 years i'm sorry i'm sounding a little more uh, polarized at this point of time but then i mean that's the reality i would like to right. bring in people who kind of dealt with change dealt with different industries worked right. in different sectors who's faced failures i would probably bring in an entrepreneur to take decisions because they know exactly how to hedge so sure. those are some of the things that i think would would might be very effective going forward for decision makers and i seriously empathize these are tough time for decision makers no it is uh, um that's the thing right uh, everyone keeps saying do this for your organization but before that we first need to do this for all these decision makers you know there's absolutely holding required Uh, and you know the worst part is I'm sorry to interject is that we want to we have to do it quickly the problem with our is not the change 
So change is all right. We've done this. We've gone through changes in organizations ever. The problem is the speed of change. It's never been so fast. So if you start building, if you have an L&D organization and if you're not thinking through the next virtual um, you know, solution or an archetype to deliver the content, right. you lose that business. So you've got to be so fast that it, it's breathtaking. I mean, I talked about Satya talking about the two-year innovative plan, such a crunching it to a two-month plan, which means that you've got to be competitive. You've got to do the change. And I'm not okay. I'm okay with the change. It's just the speed in which you want to change, which will make the differentiating performance. So decision makers have to take some ed edges. Yes, and absolutely. When the change you're talking about is not just moving from one place to another, right? The psychological shift and the, uh, the mental shift is more difficult. And uh, that, that, that makes it all the more challenging. Um, but keeping that in mind, um, let's assume that they learn the pace and uh, they, they are somehow able to adapt, okay? Because it is bound to happen. For survival, adaptability is the only way, right? So everyone will start uh, uh, their own journey. And I think all of us have already started our journey in the two months. Some have already graduated to a certain level. And uh, some are still thinking that everything will be fine and we can just go back to the same ways. But whichever category or segment that, uh, uh, that we fall into, how, how exactly will be the role of technology? And of course, technology's role is very important. So I'm not going to get into the importance of the technology, right? But what are the different mediums or shifts in the technology? Because online learning is also very different, right? Our distance learning has also been very different. One distance learning that we used to see or remote learning is what uh, uh, these uh, courses used to be, right? They'll send you material, you uh, read, and then you will appear for one exam sometime. And uh, then NIIT happened and in, you know, uh, what? There's so many of these technical training, uh, distance learning programs happen. Then universities also started offering distance learning courses. Same thing is happening for the online or the e-learning that we talk about in the company's context also, right? Now we have these videos and then you can create uh, uh, the text-based modules. So much is there in the online stuff also, right? So when we talk about technology or technological advancement from that perspective, um, any thoughts on that, Anjan? Because this is also another confusing thing. Uh, E-modules, AR, VR, Zoom sessions, this too much, so many options out there. Yes, so there is a clutter and completely agree with, with resonate with what you're saying. But the way I, I see this, and we're talking futuristic, Pallavi, is that you know one of the things that I see technology evolving in this space is I think technology has been looked at as a holistic set of services mm -hmm. that it provides to different segments of business, you be it R&D, be it customer service, be it sales, be it trade marketing, et cetera, be it, be it business development. The way I see technology evolving in this age is that nowadays technology shapers are going to start designing archetypes specific to learning. And there are one or two in the globally. I mean, there's some of them already existing, but they didn't, it's not widespread. So you might have an HR learning platform company mm -hmm. which specializes only in working with HR leaders to devise cost-effective, quick, off-the-shelf learning platforms, which is different from a technology archetype in mm. marketing or a technology archetype in R&D or for that matter, supply chain. So you would slowly get that right. technology getting dissipated into different functional silos because it's now becoming the value creator. So that's from an organization structure or the technology archetype level. And that's my, that's my thought through. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would love to be funding a technology company only for HR because learning is now, we really don't know whether to use Zoom or whether to use Microsoft Teams. So I would be somebody to say, hey, you want these functionalities? Help me design or advise you on what's best for you. So the essential fundamental or need assessment will stay. Right. It's just what leads to the design will change. So that's the shift that I see in technology servicing in organizations. And you will have a lot of Indian companies, companies from Israel, companies from um, United States and, and, and so on and so forth, 
who would start getting these 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 small startups who would design stuff only for it so if you say what you know what 60% of my work is outbound do you think zoom is the right platform frankly if i have this question i really don't have a choice because i really don't know what's the difference between you know all of it. it's 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 actually hearsay but do you have a subject matter expert apart from it from a functional background to say you know what if you want 60% of your thing comes in let me help you design something unique which will help you devise that package so that's 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 what i have from a technology standpoint the other thing in investment on technology uh you would find a lot of investments that organizations are making on technology as a whole mm-hmm. um which to me is is critical so these are the technology archetypes the second piece of your question is around what do i do with the people who are using those technology what do i do with them at this point of time so one is the technology the other is what do i do with the people who are using this technology so you would there's a lot of work to be done on people who facilitate online that yeah. capability is not developed so that's the second piece that we need to address saying how do i effectively be a world class black belt online facilitator that's right? true yes so so there is this discussion on technology capability to use collaborative tools effectively to drive value for business right, right. so that's the second one and the third prism is uh, maybe my neofrontal cortex is working it's very structured but then i'll i'll start building that in <laughs> the, the, the 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 third one is around trying to see what my customers or my stakeholders want from that experience so when you define technology don't define whether it's zoom or microsoft so that's the first piece of the puzzle and you will have people coming in to give you that customization trust me you will uh the second one is what do how do i train you and me in becoming an effective online virtual developer right you know so you might want to get skills around instruction design which never happened in hr in our b schools yes so so in cornell you don't have instructional design so how do i build in skills around instructional design within hr to develop content which is capable or or amenable to virtual learning and the third piece is who are my stakeholders and how are their experience so that data comes in and say hey you know having done all that and invested so much money this is the experience that you get so that's that's what i have to say when it comes to technology the one who the, the infrastructure the person who uses it and the person who experiences it no thank you for dividing it very well because uh, uh clearly there is so much expertise so while everyone is speaking about the opportunities which they are seeing out of this whole covid-19 you know and the different changes in work from home uh, i would not want to tag it as an opportunity because uh, we are also people you know uh, we are also privy to a lot of other information so calling this an opportunity time is not really a fair thing to do but let's say whatever is going to get churned out of it and uh, taking a lead from what you just shared one of the things that will get churned out is new areas of specialization and profession you know new Absolutely. professions of course and new area of specializations in the existing professions people will be more keen on developing niche areas of intelligence to fill the gap when we talk about uh, remote learning or learning in a distance or a you know virtual environment and that is what will be we sought also with Absolutely. all these things in picture anjan do you believe there will be more inclusive environment you see um, see one of the things that i think when technology is looked at as a forefront given the the current reality of distance and all of that uh, i have a different point of view on inclusion because of, of what i experience and i think an inclusive environment in organizations will essentially be defined by how engaged that you make the other person from the other side right yes. it's about the level of engagement that you make uh that you build how you build that engagement is a semantic so you can build an engagement by taking them out for coffee after training or you can build an engagement within the training room or you can build an engagement around a technology platform right so i would like to keep the technology platform and the shape and the form of it separately on the type of inclusion mm-hmm. right but i think the narrative on inclusion itself will def- get redefined so when you're looking at inclusion you typically look at three types of inclusion inclusion by my manager which is my immediate superior inclusion at the workplace which mm-hmm. is what you do with your uh, you know with your workplace 
uh, which is your functions and inclusion with the form, which is what the culture stands for, right? I think the, the piece that's going to be really redefined is the inclusion with my manager. Hmm. Because that level of interface is something that we need to really think through. How do I increase that engagement level? Okay, because that's, to me, is 70% of the job done. So yes, inclusion is going to get impacted. Do we have all the answers to, in, and, and that should be looked from an engagement standpoint. And, the, and I think the piece around the inclusion of company culture, I don't think so it's going to get eroded because company itself is redefining cultures given the new reality. So that's going to go through the change. I think what's going to impact you and me as employees of the company is how is it that I'm interfacing with my manager through this all semantics around technology and distance? How often does my manager reach out to me? Does that manager return my call? And if he or she doesn't, does he or she just says, you know, I will take your call tomorrow as I'm busy today, right. rather than interpreting saying, you know what, he or she is ignoring me. So you will have those sets of discussions playing in your mind or on your, what I call as um, uh, subconscious uh, persona, which will mm -hmm. work in your mind saying, you know, why is he not answering my call? The other option was you could have walked out to the door next, you know, in, a, in the next door and say, hey, you know what, can we do this? Yes. Now, that is where I think the inclusion would be. And leaders and decision makers has to be increasingly responsive to be able to respond to such silent expectations. Some mm. of it will not be able to come, you know, will not be able to voice some because there are cultural aspects. So, you know, an Australian would be more vocal than a Korean. Because right. the Korean culture is not very vocal. So you need to figure out what is inclusion in these nature and how is it that I engage meaningfully given the contours of culture and geographies that you operate with. And the impact level, or I think the significant impact would be for inclusion with the manager and the person. The workplace, I think we will build systems around it. It's still an issue, but it's not going to be fundamentally different. Right. There are other areas to work on. It's about self and self-awareness and lots of that. But I think fundamentally, it's the manager piece that needs to be addressed absolutely urgently. But even the manager piece, Anjan, um, without contradicting this part, uh, there's this leadership and organizational role that plays a huge part when driving inclusion, right? Let's take a very small example of, uh, let's say, people with special abilities, right? For, uh, for the longest time, companies and their leaders, I will not say that they've been using it as an excuse. It's just... You, you have not gone through the learning curve, right? So it, it, it seems when you have not ran even five kilometers, a 21 kilometer marathon looks like a huge task to you, right? So the same way, I will say that when you have never ventured onto the path of inclusion, you know, for a specific segment of the talent population, um, you leaders think of it as a humongous task. And that is why... Um, we as a society, even after 50, 100 years of women already stepping into the workforce, we are still talking about gender diversity being equivalent to women inclusion only. Right? We have still not ventured into the conversation of people from LGBTQ uh, you know, uh, uh, representation. Or when we talk about diversity, we are not open to a very uh, active discussion around the inclusion of people with special abilities. Right. So now that the infrastructure will change and the environment for the work uh, presence, the physical ability will no longer be the mandate, right? Because the shift has occurred. Um, it may not have anything to do with learning directly, but in a way it still does. Will organizations and leaders learn more about certain aspects of inclusion definition also? Will, is, do we see a possibility of that avenue opening and when that happens um how will the technology change or play its part because now even the e-learning modules or the virtual learning environment cannot be like this right what if the person uh, is uh, not conducive to the hearing the you know uh, side of the modules what if a person is not conducive to the visual side of the modules so how how exactly is it going to fuel it or is it going to continue restricting the inclusion of certain uh, you know uh, aspect of the diversity that we talk about because no, I, think, I think sorry to break you i'm optimistic like the minute this happens one of the things that we 
uh, projected or predicted were that they will be more, it will be easy for now women to enter workforce because now everyone will be able to empathize that even if you're working from home and your kid is shouting in the background, hey, you can be very productive. You know, you're, you will work as seriously because now you have empathized, you're being part of that, you know, environment. This is like a simulation of work from home for everyone right now, wherein you believe that it is possible. Uh, similarly, people with uh, mobility, you know, concerns and restrictions, uh, one of the reasons companies have not been including them is because there's an infrastructural need that they will have to be, uh, the, the need will be to get them to the office and then stairs and whatever other things that are required. If we take away this need of physical presence away, right, uh, we were very hopeful that there will be more companies who will be open to now uh, this category of inclusion. Um, if that happens, if the technological barrier or technology barrier and learning barrier around these, uh, uh, you know, development initiatives, uh, how is this going to impact? No, I think it's it's an extremely powerful point, Pallavi, and I'm, I'm glad we are discussing this in this forum because I, I completely resonate that there is finally a light in the end of the tunnel when it comes to looking at inclusion of specially abled uh, uh, individuals in, in, in our society. And, 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 I, I know, and the points that you raised are so, so true is because if I were looking at productivity, the definition of productivity will now be not, look, not, not be looked at mm -hmm. in terms of when you come in versus and when you go out, right. but will be looked out in the output that you that you generate in that eight hours working wherever you are from. Yes. Therefore, those 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 filters on mobility, filters on on gender, filters on a state of life for a particular individual, be it maternity leave, be it paternity leave, be it demise of a family member, all of that will slowly get blurred. And mm -hmm. I see there is an opportunity for corporations to kind of not even specifically look into it. In fact, my point of view is don't even start being conscious of the fact of being specially abled or normal, etc. Because at the end of the day, if you your role discards mobility and office infrastructure, hmm. what else would you define productivity with? Purely output. So if right. the output will remain constant, the question is whether the output will be impacted by disabled, and that's a different question right. that we'll discuss separately. But I think there is definitely an opportunity, and I agree with you on your, your point of view, that it opens up doors for organizations to look at it. That's point one. The second one is how will technology support all that? And to my earlier point, you will, as I told you, that in going forward, you will have customized offerings hmm. on how do I look at learning? And I'm talking about enterprise learning, not HR learning yes. in different functions. So you'll have a marketing functional IT company or a HR learning IT company. And I, I'm hopeful that those companies come forward and, and, and creates like the way you have a, a special elevator to help a, a, a differently able person in a mall, you would possibly design archetypes within your IT platform to be able to make them more effective at the lowest cost possible. Right. I would want the government to kind of subsidize those products to the mass possible and even government and, and our corporates to kind of look and come in to kind of build in those solutions. The end to end op op opportunity is what I see is the ability for these differently able uh, people coming into the workforce would be a lot higher than what you've seen before. And that's my guess. And I think I'm fairly confident with what I see around on discussions that's happening, that they are open now very consciously of not making that differentiation. Hmm. And those are actually for roles that they've earmarked as work from home roles. And look at admin jobs, look at administrative expert jobs. Those are jobs. The last one I want to make is, especially in India, where a lot of our decisions on careers are still governed by taking care of our old family taking care of our location or our rice fields in a village and that's why i can't transform myself from a village x to a bombay or a calcutta those will also get blurred so you will have a lot of influxion of rural employment coming in mm -hmm. this is this 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 whole thing around inclusion 
of workforce, not only differently able, but people who are remotely working. If you have that optic fiber that reaches you, you might have the best brains in that village bringing that intellectual and thought leadership to your enterprise. I see that also moving forward exponentially. So I see a lot of positives out of this, this situation. Uh, I don't see it's a disabler. And in some places there would be setbacks, but I'm, I'm willing to be tested on that because all it stands now is a set of hypotheses which needs to be proved at this level. Right, right. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Anjan. I, I think uh, those were some very micro nuanced pointers which are not being discussed, which are not being written about. And uh, um, nobody has, because everyone is pressed on time, nobody is able to take a pause and say that, let me think this through and uh, see what is it that we are missing out and, you know, in, in terms of our planning. So my last question that I will ask you, you know, and uh, let's like, like we have been speaking so far in the past one hour, let's leave the development of the organizations a little on the side, right? Because an organization is as good as its leaders, right? Uh, a student is as good as the teacher, right? So here, if we, if we have to summarize, what are the three or four things, okay, that the decision makers, be it from HR, be it from functional heads, anybody who has to now start working on the knowledge and the behavioral learning and development of their team. If I'm a marketing head, I need to focus on my team's learning. If I'm an HR, I need to look at that. If I'm a finance head, I need to look at my team. What are the three or four things that they need to know? They need to learn first. It's like looking at a mirror. You know, it's a, it's a self-check that do I know these things? Let me go and study and learn on these aspects before I start planning and writing and drafting these initiatives. What would be those things? Right. And, and, and I think, I think and, and, and this is just an expansion of the unlearning discussion that we had earlier. So when we're looking at unlearning items for decision makers, one of the things, and are you restricting only to corporates? Are you looking at beyond corporate? Beyond. Give me both. Fundamentally at, at, at the high level. So one of the things that we need to be very savvy of as, as, as people who participate in the story of India or, or global growth is to be able to first accept that collaborative communication is now a reality. Mm -hmm. And there are skills around collaborative communication that needs to be quickly turned around. So there's, an so there's an assumption that I know how to, I know all the elements of Zoom, that I know how to run polling, right? but I only know how to run videos. I don't know how to look at breakout teams. There's an assumption that, you know, during my, during my workshop or my, or my uh, valedictory speech, before the, I, after the speech, I would want them to learn something. There's an assumption that that leader or the decision maker will tell them, you know, do you have an Alexa at home? Why did you go and find that out through your Alexa? There's an assumption. I'm not sure how many people do that. A lot of lot of people who are now leveraging, you know, technologies like Alexa and podcasts to mm. be able to look at experiences beyond that two, three hours of inputs that you give. Right. Now you need to get, so that's the first thing decision makers have to accept. You know, they got to strip off their legacies and come up saying that let's come afresh. Yes. Let's come afresh and look at what are some of the avenues of collaborative communications which is relevant to what I do. It could be an educationist. Uh, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be a learning guy. It could be an entrepreneur. Or it could be government. So just, just shed that. The other thing is propagating the concept of growth mindset within everybody. You know, and when I say growth mindset, I'm specifically looking at agile teams. You have to ensure that projects are not 10 years or five years old. You will yeah. have a situation where somebody will come contribute for three months, they will form agile teams, they will do the stuff and they will leave. So decision makers should be ready to not be too loyal mm -hmm. with the fact of contribution. You can go to another project, but the concept of agile output is right. becoming a reality for decision makers. I think decision makers across globe, right? Look at the way what London and Lilikani do with the UID. It's a critical, fantastic agile project. He just mm -hmm. came in, install the system, you're supposed to do that, and he disbanded it and went off, right? Or he didn't right. disband it, he kind of left it and went off. Mm -hmm. So that's what I call as agility, and it's gonna be a reality, 
because and you got to accept that fact that it's not going to last for the next two years or three years it's going to just make those agile teams high energy high capable teams that's that's the, that's the second thing the third thing is the brief for talent acquisition across mm. governments across entrepreneurs if you're looking at people the threshold qualification changes overtly right you don't need to become a super duper presenter <laughs> in a conference room anymore Right. You can wear a black t-shirt and even talk well. So, so you need to be, so the brief on collaborative consciousness, brief on presenting or, or coming across as a highly collaborative communicator should be a threshold. Because my discussions with people are, okay, fine, this is interesting, but do you have a solution around virtual? So that's the first question I ask now. I don't even ask how good you are as a, as, as, as an, as a consultant. Hmm. That's, that's, that's the reality. So, so that's what I think decision makers should be able to kind of look at. And the fourth part to your point is to be conscious about being inclusive. I think organizations should not forget that there is a segment of our population globally who needs a customized way of dealing with this situation. Right. Unfortunately, as you rightly pointed out, it's very skewed towards the majority. And it's time that we consciously think about what makes them effective because it's ultimately so it's not going to if you're not doing them a favor it's just that it's going to add value to what i call as innovation and more productive workforce yes. going forward right so so to me i think it's these are the four things that i would recommend the growth mindset piece the ability to be be an effective collaborative tools communicator look at inclusion and have the mindset to form agile teams disband and move on to the next level oh wonderful Wonderful. And that, that's, I think there's no other better way to sum it up because uh, that was our intent. We want, we want these leaders to know how exactly in the times to come, right? Before you start worrying about who you all are required to take care of as leaders, you need to take care of yourself, right? You need to prep up. What are the things that you will be needing? Thank you so much, Anjan. This, uh, this, this actually has been so educational. Uh, very resonating also and every time you said that uh, this is something which uh, which which you know which resonates with you it makes me feel us me individually as well as as a team us uh, quite happy uh, because these are the trends these are the concerns that are bothering us also and to receive answers from you on these and to be able to share it with our audience has been just an amazing one hour for us I once again thank you for joining us on this one. Thank you so much for having me, Pallavi. It was enriching talking to you. And, and I wish you all the best for all the ventures to come uh, of the good work that you've been doing. Oh, thank you. I oh, wish we'll you all be, the best. We'll not be leaving you. I already have two, three things I have to talk to you about <laughs> offline. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I will be doing that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye.